Nice to see you all here. I hope you have some questions that I can have some answers to. And those who have questions I can't answer, sorry about that. But they have dictionaries and Google, so I'll find a way to get the information that's not too complicated. It doesn't require more than I have. Having said that, uh, in New York, the sun, sun is shining, and I'm very happy to see it come out. Uh, you people who are here are bringing sunshine to my life, as I've been off for a while, but I'm working my way back up to the bandstand. I'm now I've got the first two notes from that major scale under control. So relax. I'm working my way up. Questions? Okay. Nobody's going to start. Yes. Ah, ah, Tom, you can un unmute yourself, please. Uh, Ron, Tom yes. took those great uh, notes from one of the previous um, one of the previous uh, uh, calls like this, and also sent you some very nice healing information. Okay. Hello, Tom. Hello, Saran. How are Good you? I'm excellent, man. Thank you. How's your back? Uh, it's it's waiting for you to get better. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, um, I'll take some notes today if it's okay. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And um, if you have any questions on the stuff I sent you, um, I have a bad back too. So i um, uh, love to help you out to get you okay. back on the bandstand quick. Okay, me too. Thanks. I heard that, man. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure, sir. Okay, we have a question from Mr. Oak. What is the best advice for up and coming sessions basis? Mr. Oak, you can unmute yourself and wave or say something so we can see you. Yeah. Okay, there you are at the bottom of the page. The, the question is what again, uh, Ms. Uh, Shelburne? Um, what is the best advice for up and coming sessions basis? Uh, I'm not sure how you define session guys who just make records and with no affiliation for labels or types of music. Those kind of session guys who are like uh, super subs, those kind of people. Uh, I tell all my students, and while you're not a student, you're an interested party here. So I'm telling all my interested party people that when you leave home for these sessions, in this case, a freelance recording session, I tell them all, leave your, e leave, your ego, leave your ego at home and bring a second pair of ears. I think freelancers get so caught up in uh, missing the point. They've been contracted for this gig because the owner or the producer or the band leader feels that like they can add something to their record. They would be missing without them there. It doesn't mean showing them your complete cupboard of dishes. They just need a cup with a different size spoon. That's true. Or, may, or maybe as little as possible. Uh, so if you can manage your ego. Yeah, you I was bring, kind of thinking of bringing the three in later today. Say again? Yeah. I kind of got, I missed that comment. Yeah, I put my battery in. Anybody? I think somebody needs somebody to mute their line, yeah, please. Somebody needs, yeah. everybody should be muted mute. except the person Maestro's talking to. Okay, ready for the next question? Um, and it is from um, Trevor Kinsel. Will you talk about intonation, the best way to be in tune? Um, short of practicing every day, you know, there are several concepts on how to, how to make intonation get better. Everything from drones to playing along with an instrument unison or at certain intervals. I, I've never found the yeah, drone to work for me because- Let's uh, to a Zoom call here. Guys, if Paul could I, please, guys, you have to mute please yourself. mute possible? yourself. Can we go? Yes. Okay. Um, I've, I've never been a fan of the drone, first of all, because the drone pitch and the tone is so awful. I don't want to have to worry about playing in tune with something that's got a terrible sound that doesn't match my bass sound at all. So I've never been a fan of that, that particular process, although people have had tremendous success with them. Good for you guys and gals. Uh, I, I think the only way to, what I try to do is keep a tuning fork nearby. That's like 250 now. It's, like, it's a square thing with a stick and you just bang it on your knee and put it on the bridge. I like to using that A, that sound of that A as my, as my tuning pitch and the next note, whatever it is, the proper interval of distance between a third or a fourth or an octave or a ninth, 
compared to this A I'm banging in my ear with on my bridge. Uh, but intonation also depends on how much you're listening to the guys around you and the intonation of the band. Uh, that's really awkward. Uh, the horn players are in front of you by and large, the piano's on your right, the drummers whose drums may not be tuned at all is on your left, and it's left up to you to find one note as an answer to the band where you think the pitch really is. Uh, it's a big responsibility. And we don't get paid nearly enough for that too. You know, <laughs> we don't just show up. We're the guys who do a lot of things among them, give the band the pitch. And if you have seen any of the, any of the videos I'm on, occasionally the horn player will look around at me and nod his head. That means he's asked me, is he in tune or not? And depending on what I tell him, is he nods like this or like this, he understands why I think he just missed the A440 by three counts. Uh, and again, the easiest way for me to recommend intonation is comparing intervals. Assuming you have the first interval in tune, which is A in this case, can you play? Can you play an E? Can you play an E flat? Can you play a B natural? And compare it to this A sound in your ear that you just banged on this bridge and the, uh, your knee, probably. Uh, but there's no magic to playing in tune. I think it involves with one hearing your environment, hearing the pitch of the band. And is the band willing to accept your view that the saxophone player is playing so loud he's playing a quarter tone sharp? And will he would be willing to, to listen to your pitch once you're comfortable that it's right and pull it out of whatever they do to make the pitch a little better than you think it should be? But there's no magic potion. One cup of this and a stir, stir lightly and add ice. I wish. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Rachel Courtney. Oh, when a female question. Good. Where were you the last two times we did this stuff? Thank you for coming by to say hello. When writing, you can unmute yourself if you want to say something, Rachel. Please. Um, when writing set lists, how much time do you usually set aside for improvisations? Is it usually 16 bars here, 16 there? Or do you set time for really letting loose? It depends on letting loose how loose they, <laughs> they want to get and what was my tolerance for being loose is. Uh, but when I plan a set, uh, Rachel, I try to plan the set on two things, the events of the day and what the band needs to do better than last night plan the same set. Uh, how, how long the song lasts depends on the audience, depends on the sound of the room, depends on the sound of the band, depends on how well that soloist is playing. And, and, and how long? I, I like to think that one of the things I'm, I'm specific with with my guys and gals is that know when to stop. And uh, I, I used to have a, 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 an umbrella with a, with a hook on the end, and I keep it near the bandstand. So when I look at the bandstand, they know that this, here comes the shepherd's crook, take out like this, you know. It's a comfortable threat that they know I'm, I'm not inclined to use it, but I've been threatening to use it for a very long time. And hopefully they aren't the first person to see that they really mean that, you know. But, but, but I think I plan sets, and that depends on how the band responds to my choices. Uh, I don't ask them the choices. I want to see how they play, how they respond musically. And after the set, we go in the back and say, well, guys, how do you feel about that? And some of them say it was okay, or it's too fast, or the keys are too similar together. I take it under consideration. Then I do what I had planned to do anyway. <laughs> no, I give my undivided attention because uh, they're part of my thoughts and they help me plan the set for the next night. But what I do plan the set is because I want them to know that they're coming to work tonight and there's no guessing what the tune is. We're unguessing the keys. We're unguessing the arrangements. This is not a jam session, guys. This is a band that has a format. I am responsible for the format. And for the time being, you're, you're responsible for following my format. You have lev le le levity, you have the ability to play softer or louder or you know, whatever you have in mind for your sound of the band. Ultimately, the choice of the set depends, depends on me. And I'm aware of everybody's chops and how long we've been playing, you know, no sound check, no rehearsal. I'm, I'm pretty aware of those things that get in the way of a, a, a comfortable set list. Uh, but I spend the time to make sure that if, if it goods for me, I think I've hired the guys and gals who will be equally good for them. Uh, until I come in and find coal in my sock, I think I did okay. Thank um, you, Rachel. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Trevor, Trevor Kinsel asks, will you talk about intonation? The best. Oh, we said that. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Tommy Plummer has his hand up. Go ahead, Tommy, please. Good. I, um, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm just I'm a nervous wreck, uh, Mr. Carter. I, Good. I just, I'm just I'm just there. But listen, I just bought your 1965 concert uh, that you did at the Plug Nickel in 1965, December 22nd. There was eight CDs in that. That's what you, yourself, Miles, uh, Tony, Wayne, Ron, and Herbie. And uh, I bought it a month ago, and I have not stopped playing it. You are a genius, and, and uh, I'm a music person, and I can hear that bass in the bag, man. And I say that Ron Carter is beyond belief. I I I just I, I advise anybody you need to get that and hear Ron in that in that concert to plug nickel. It was just a it was just a powerful thing. And just one one last but not least, I like to say this here. Uh, I understand that that you were the leader of the group. And so, what is it like being the leader? Uh. uh... There's so much information coming at me. I'm not quite sure where to start. So I'll just mumble a few words and we'll see how I come out. The first thing is that I didn't know there was a six CD package from that concert, from that week at Plug Nickel. Uh, when, yeah. when you get the moment, if, if you will email uh, uh, my, my site and tell me where you found it and, and uh, stuff, I'd like to be able to invest in that site, that eight CD package myself. Secondly, no one knew we were recording, and we didn't know it was recorded until the record came out. As it turned out, my job has been to track down the record, take it to Columbia and the Union, and get paid for that session. Number three, my son Miles was born during the course of uh, week to week of the plug nickel, and the Chicago. The, there were flights to Chicago to New York every hour and hour up until ten o'clock at night, I guess. So, for the first three nights of their gig, I commuted to New York. I played a gig in New York in the, at night at, the, at Plug Nickel, took a plane to New York, do an eight o'clock theory class, babysit my young sons till time for the next flight going back to Chicago for three nights. Uh, and, and I was never aware that the record had the kind of uh, 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 earthquake effect on the music because I hadn't heard any of that stuff until one night, one afternoon at record date, the guy said, hey man, I heard that record that you're on the Plug Nickel. It's a great record, man. I said, what record? What plug nickel? And uh, so I borrowed some money and went out and bought this record. I said, wow, the band sounds okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, but I have to listen to that set and see what they recorded and what, what they didn't record. And eight CDs, well, that's, that's a lot of playing in there. And, and uh, given uh, we had no real sound check and we were not into rehearsing and we were learning, we were learning each other's foibles, each other's, each other's things that they like to do. Uh, we were all going to school. And again, the bandstand is the best place to go to school when you have four other guys who are interested in getting better like you are. Uh, but thank you for both those, uh, the awareness of a eight CD package. I guess Columbia's putting them out. I'm not sure who, who, who owned, even owns that stuff right now, right now but. Amazon, like to... I got it on Amazon for $500, Ron. $500. Well, I've been, well, I've been off for a month now. I'm sure that's out of my price range. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. So thank you for the interest. Yeah, Amazon. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll we'll figure that out, my friends and I, and we'll see what we come. And thank you so much for being here, and for laying something on my ear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Kurt Morrow asks, um, "Would you hello? <laughs> would you mind speaking on how the jazz bassists who came before you influenced you when you came up?" when you came to the base. Wellman Broad, Milt Hinton, Chester Zardy, Oscar Pettiford. I, I know those names. I know I, I never met Oscar. He left, he passed away. Actually moved to Europe before I got to New York and passed away shortly after. Milt Hinton was one of my dear friends and the other guys were before, before my time. Having given you a, a, a base background, uh, neither one of those bass players influenced me. I was more influenced by J.J. Uh, Johnson who you know was a fantastic trombone player. And if you saw him play, you know he very seldom went past the bell. It was all, it was all here. 
like four inches from his face. Right. Having studied trombone, I knew what the intervals were, but I wasn't clearly in that class. But to hear what he did to the trombone lines and the solos he played, given his width and breadth of this concept and knowledge of what the trombone could physically do in a small space of time, that was very impactful on me. I said, now, the, the, the bass, people are playing the bass like this. They're playing as vertical as possible. Right. My view seems to be at that time, I'm just developing it. If I play it more horizontally, can I find a better choice of notes with less physical effort? Right. I'm still working on that, but I'm getting better at it. <laughs> well, thank and, you. Wait, wait, wait. And next person was Cecil Payne. I worked with Cecil mm -hmm. Payne, a baritone saxophone player for Randy Weston's band uh, for two or three years. And what impressed me about Cecil Payne, he came along at the time there was several other major baritone players. He had Jerry Mulligan, he had Serge Charloff, uh, he had, he had uh, uh, Pepper Adams, Jerry Mulligan. They all had their own sounds. And here's this guy from Brooklyn, by way of the West Indies, playing baritone with his own kind of sound. It didn't sound like any of those guys. Yeah. And, and now, I don't know what he's doing, but I have to watch him because I, I can't understand how he gets such a personal Cecil Payne kind of sound out of the same horn that those guys have. Right. And uh, that's been my, my, my uh, thing for all these years. Can I get my sound? And can I get my sound whenever the bass case comes off that bass, wherever I am, whenever that happens. Right. And to this day, I'm getting closer to that. <laughs> but bass players at that time were not an influence on me at all. I see. I understand. Well, I'm at North Texas finishing my master's in jazz studies with Lynn Seaton. Oh, yes. Give my love, please. I sure will. And I just finished my arranging course last this past semester. It's only been done a few days with Rich DeRosa. Oh, yeah. We did a record together. Rich, yeah. please, tell I know my, that, please tell me I said hello and, and happy holidays to you guys. I will. Well, thank you. So part of my oral exam is going to be, uh, Lynn's going to ask me, just say what you <laughs> know about the history of jazz bass from the beginning. And so I thought I wanted to ask you about how they influenced you. And I understand that the, your influences early on came from other, other sources. Yes, th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. And how about happy holidays to you and yours? Thank you. Okay, uh, Jay Holden asks, from bebop, cool, and hard bop to free jazz to fusion, musicians have experimented with making all kinds of sounds on their instruments. What was it like living through that and playing with folks like Coltrane, which I think you missed him, uh, Davis, and others? Well, they had their own sounds. Miles had his sound, Train had, had his the Archie Sheps and, and, and all those new guys, Sam Rivers, they had their kind of sounds. Uh, I, I was less concerning, I was less concerned, I think, with how can I make my sound fit in the various sounds that were around me. I was, and I still am concerned with, how can I make, how can I make the bass sound like, like I wanted to sound every night? Whatever that is, can I get that sound yesterday? Can I get it, can I look forward to that sound tomorrow? Whatever else I'm in, I want to I want to play like I want to hear. To make that work, I need to have a concept of what I want the bass to sound like, that I'm except being responsible for. Uh, it never occurred to me that I'd be on so many records, and, and uh, as we say, I'm doing it. I'm I'm enjoying not making them for the moment due to my issues. But I expect to go to work first in a year or so and and make some more. And I hope that this uh, vacation I'm en enjoying more or less. Will not have me go out and go to the go to the store and find some more bass sounds at a discount. Uh, I like to think that my sound is mine, and, and that being off will not distray my make my ears stray from what I expect to hear when I take the bass out of my case and hit two or three notes and say, "That's me." Uh, everyone hears the instrument differently, and I like to think that along the way I've decided that my bass should sound like this. This. And so far, I'm making the point to be pretty good at that. You know, I, I kind of picked the bass, and it sounds like me. And, and uh, I'm ready to go home. I did my job, and I sound like me tonight. Good night. Uh, but the, the sounds that the new, I, I, actually, you know, I like to hear guys like William Parker play. If they find things to do with the instrument that don't occur to me. Uh, about five years ago, David Gage and, and brought a band of 
bass players from Paris. And they were making all kinds of sound with the bow and playing by the tailpiece and stuff that it never crossed my mind as being a valid way to use the bass for me. And I appreciated all those choices. And I'm amazed that none of them occurred to me. And I pick up the bass and play open A string and say, that's why that didn't occur to me. I like that. Right. Well, thank you, Maestro, for your You're time. Welcome. You're welcome. I'll see you in the corner. <laughs> Um, Meryl, Meryl uh, asks, can you talk about the experience of putting the documentary together? Oh, well, okay. the documentary, for those who haven't seen it or heard about it, uh, I met a gentleman six years ago who asked me, was I interested in having him do a, my story? And I said, well, man, I, my story changes every night. My story changes with every band I play with. I, I'm not sure that... I'm the best guy to tell you my story because I'm not quite sure. I remember, I remember much of it. Uh, I've got a pretty busy schedule and you're busy too. I do other projects. I'm not sure we have enough time to put together a concept and follow it through given our busy schedules. He said, well, I'll give it some thought. And so I called him back the next day. I said, well, my schedule is pretty full. If you will allow me to miss some meetings with you and make, make myself difficult to reach, we can probably do this project. And for six years or so, he would follow me when I got to a place more than 20 minutes. Or I would invite him to a session I'm doing that he would never, he would not know about. And I'd get him backstage and my friends who were interested in this project to see what I was doing, uh, agreed to have some con talk conversations with the, the film crew and my producer of this record, uh, Peter Schnall. And uh, this went on for six years or so. And finally we had enough, or he had enough, and they put together with this, with the people who do the editing and stuff and the sound people, and they put together, I think, a, a really fantastic project of what I am, you know? Uh, I guess the first thing I had to consider was that, that I mind people seeing me without the bass in my hand. Mm -hmm. And what would come up in the conversations when I'm not talking about the bass? Would I risk that? Do I know enough other things than the bass? Well, as it turned out, I know about three things other than the bass, but I know them pretty good. <laughs> uh, one of the questions I'm asked all the time is, uh, what did Miles talk about? Well, I don't know what he talked about. The guy, he talked to me about stocks, talked to me about the black politicians in, in, in Harlem, he, about the boxers he knew. We never talked about a chord. We never talked about music. Mm -hmm. We never talked about favorite players. I'm sure he had his, and I had mine. But we never talked about that. We talked about kids. He liked me, he liked my two sons. And I enjoyed hanging out with his whenever I saw them. But we never talked about music at all. Uh, and, and I hope that the people who see this documentary will appreciate the width and breadth of what I know other than the bass and three other things. Well, it was a wonderful documentary. Thank you Thank for you. giving him six years and sharing with us those six years and, and the lifetime of memories there. Thank you. Thank you. It's called Ron Carter, Finding the Right Notes. And the PBS has it or Amazon has it. You can buy a copy. Yep. I just found that out 20 minutes ago. And we have the soundtrack. And the soundtrack just came out yep. on in and out Records with a fantastic recorded sound of the people who are on this particular uh, six-hour down the two and a half hour project. Uh, some of them guys are on this, and gals are on this particular uh, s unit that has uh, the soundtrack from Ron Carter, Find the Right Notes. They're both worth your while. Makes sense to have some, have fewer things to worry about. Nick Keprin asks, can you please share any background or stories on the third plane sessions with Herbie and Tony? Well, we'd come in from, uh, with Washington D.C., I think, from the airport right down to the studio, right to the studio in, in Ber Berkeley, whose studio was owned by Herbie's manager, David Rubenstein, I think Rubenstein. And uh, we had just finished playing a week at the gig somewhere on the East Coast. Ended up ending in Washington, I think. And uh, uh, Herbie was going to make a record as a trio. Said, "While we're here, let's go make go to David's studio and make this record." So we probably went from the airport right to the studio. Uh, at the time, I was allowed to bring my bass to the gigs. Unfortunately, that's the time going past. 
and uh, you made this record called uh, The Third Plane, is it? Yep. Yeah. Yes. And uh, we had had some trio gigs before, and we had been done other gigs. We had a a, 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 a decent sized library, uh, and as as everyone, Herbie, me, Tony, trusted each other's judgment. When someone made a suggestion of the tune, we tried out see if we ever, if everybody knew the song, if we knew the changes, if we knew the form, and once we agreed on songs that each of us knew well enough to make a record of it. The results is the record that you just had at your house. Nice record. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, You're welcome. You, you hear that trust, you know, among the three of you. I, I love the tone. The, you, you hear the, the wood of the instruments. Yes. I love it. Thank and, you. And the frequencies of all the instruments, Tony's drums is your bass, is Herbie's piano. It's like this. I miss Tony. I talked. I saw, I saw Herbie last night, by the way. He's on, on tour with the... Uh, it came in for some meetings in New York, uh, and we had a chance to reminisce about uh, the days. And I explained to him, one of the things I miss, Herbie, is uh, Tony's not here to see how much better I got in 20 mm -hmm. years, 40 years. And I've really gotten better. I've had something for him. So, I, I don't know what you've been doing, man, but this is what I've been doing. Bam! Yeah. Well, I can't say that now, only in my head. Well, as a drummer, he's my ultimate hero. So, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. Two two years before I was born, he died. Died the day I was due. Two years. Oh before. my. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, ultimate hero. So thank, thank you. you. You're a massive inspiration. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Audrey Hall uh, would like to know um, what, especially, you know, you've been going through this. Uh, you know, time off to heal your back. What do you do for this or any other time for stress relief and to keep yourself focused? Um, that's a lot of questions. I'm trying to figure out how best to answer all of them. Uh, with, with my uh, uh, medically induced time off here, what I've been doing is working on some more books for my library. And the one we're working on right now is called, I think, Ron Carter Drops. And what it involves with this is uh, the ickety booms that we all play. Uh, I have mine, and, and people want to know, how do you do that? And when do you do that? And where do you do that? Well, this book that Mr. Dave Barron and I are working on will hopefully come out in February or so, and we hope to have uh, uh, some nice examples of what I do during these rhythmic alterations of four beats to the bar. And hopefully you'll find somewhere you can take my example and do something else with it. Uh, again, it's in work in, uh, uh, work in prog progress, progress. And hopefully in February we'll be have the uh, display of this is what this time did. In the meantime, I'm enjoying not worrying about the bandstand sets. I'm not worried about how long the guys are going to play the solos. I'm not worried about who's going to be in tune. Not concerned about who doesn't have the right uniform tie on tonight. I'm I'm, I'm enjoying uh, knowing where uh, the light to my refrigerator is all the time, the same place it was last night. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying not going to the laundry so often to pick up my laundry from the my suits, and most of all, I'm enjoying having dinner with my wife in the same seat every night. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have. Um, Nick Ketter, I'm impressed by your ability to play at incredibly fast tempos. Did that come naturally to you, or did you have to work on playing that fast? Playing that fast. Well, With the latter, can you share some tips on how you approached improving your speed? A uh, couple of things. Nick, did I get my first name right, Nick? Nick? Ketter? Nick? You there? You can unmute yes. yourself. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, playing fast is one thing that you can't practice at home. Uh -huh. you, can only, you, can, you can only learn how to play fast, Nick, if you're on a gig with guys who play fast. And again, there's, there's no te four teaspoons of this, a little vinegar, stir slowly and add one ice cube and put your hands in there. No, there's none of that. It, it, it boils down to one, do you, Nick, know the song? What are the changes to this tune? What's the form of this tune? 
How well do you know the bass? Do you, how well can you find the notes you think you hear? At the quarter note is 125. The more you do that with those concepts and play with enough guys who play fast, that's how you learn to play fast. There's no, there's no uh, time for the bass player not to play when it's playing fast. So you're forced to figure out how to do it on your own. Uh, again, there's no magic way to do that except being on the bandstand and being forced to do it tune after tune, night after night. Back in the day, everyone played Cherokee four times as fast to see who could stand up last. Ah. I, I like that. I told all those guys, okay, but I'll be the last guy standing. And I made sure that I was. Uh, we did three sets back in those days. So we had a lot of chances to learn how to play fast for a long period of time. The new bunch of musicians have taken a different tack to playing and, and they're not so interested in demonstrating necessarily as part of their gig or, or their, their presentation, uh, can you play this fast? Not applause, this is fast. And, and uh, play some music. One of the one of the jokes with the band was every night, so what got faster and faster, so that one night, one one night we felt like this is one measure. Next night, this is one chorus. So we learned how to play fast by playing fast enough with guys who trusted we trusted where the beat was. We we worked it out on our own own physical possibilities, and again we knew those songs, we knew the form, we knew the changes. We knew some choices we had because we had played this song long enough to figure out how best to manipulate these changes in this form at certain speeds. And this speed was perhaps ridiculous. But I wasn't going to say that. I'm not going to be a guy who's complaining about it's too fast. No. I mean, I like it, but I'm going to own it. I think that attitude helps. Okay. That, that answer is both wonderful and depressing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nick, so Nick, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Mr. Carter, you're, you're Thank, Thank you. So much. Um, Thank you. Maybe you can make Dave Schaefer a little happier. Uh, he says, can you advise us on a useful practice routine? Uh, well, when I was practicing with all seriousness, I would make sure that before I practice, I read my, my teacher's commentary from the last lesson. I wanted to know what he felt I needed to work on between that lesson and the incoming, oncoming lesson, next week's lessons. So I went in there with a plan. The first plan, part of the plan, was to know what I need to learn from last week's lesson. And two, practicing was not a, a one-man jam session. Excuse me a moment. Just trying to talk to some people here on chat while we're and people with other questions. Uh, while Maestro's waiting, I should tell you, it's all blurred behind me here, but I have about 40 soundtrack, uh, documentary soundtrack, vinyl double albums that are numbered and signed by Maestro. Uh, you'll be able to get the, um, the album, you know, anytime. But um, if you go to roncarterjazz.com and I'll put the, find the link. Simone, could you put the link in the chat to the yes, actual page? Yes, um, and you, you can get the signed ones if you hurry. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Welcome back, Maestro. Thank you. Someone wanted to know what kind of socks I was wearing. <laughs> I told them none for the day. did my day off. <laughs> Okie dokie. So now... So you asked about my practice routine. Just to, just to tie that up. Uh, again, right. uh, when I practice, I'm not doing a one-man jam session. I'm not trying to imitate Paul Chambers or Ray Brown or Oscar Perfect. I want to find out, when I play this scale, can I play it in tune again and 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 again. Sounds and like again, repetition is involved. And again. And then again. And maybe go to B flat. Uh, no, no, C again. And again. Stuff like that. It's the discipline of trying to look 
something in the eye and not give up till it's done right. I also have a book of etudes. My book that just came out, Ron Carter's Comprehensive Bass Method, has about six or seven etudes that are really great playing. So those of you who want something to practice other than Samantha books one and two, or the Tan Method, Belay, whatever, I recommend you take a look at those etudes because they require some skill. And they're based on harmony. I have my students play these etudes and figure out what chords are here. What's this, what's this melody tell me harmonically? What information do I need to learn from this chord progression? And can I play this chord progression based on the skill level this book is recommending to be able to learn how to play it fast at, at a speed with an increased level of skill that my book is supposed to be is guaranteed to give if you follow the instructions in the book. But etudes are a way to monitor your intonation, your consistent sound, your discipline, and your need not to go off and just jam in 20 minutes to break the pressure. No, man. That doesn't get it. I want to pick up the bass note. That I, if I say this passage, I can nail it. I can play it in tune. I can play the right note choices. I can play what the composer would like to hear from the bass player, and that's me. And you can only get that by having a practice, a disciplined routine. So my routine at first is to see what I did from the last lesson to improve on. Go in there with this mindset that I can't leave till this scale is in tune. Or this A2 is perfect. And can I do it again tomorrow? And tomorrow? And tomorrow? For years on end. Okay? All right. Okay. Uh, Brenda Seiler has had her hand up for a while. Brenda? Good afternoon from hey, D.C. How, how are you? It's good to, good to talk to you again, Maestro. Thank you. How can I help you? Tell me about how the group was pulled together uh, for Roberta Flack's first album. She was my music teacher oh, in wow. junior high school. Wow. And um, I think a lot of people may not have known that you were on that until they saw the documentary. So could you talk about how they pulled you in and how that group was formed? Well, initially, the, the, the real the real backstory is that this producer uh, in New York heard about her from Les McCann. Of course. Les McCann, rec well, okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Les McCann recommended that Joel Dorn record this group in Washington who was led by a singer named Roberta Flack. He thought that she was a, he, he thought she was a great act to be on Atlantic label. So they got together and they booked her for a couple of days in New York with her band from Washington, D.C., coming to New York, Atlantic Records, 60th Street and Broadway, third floor, to make this record. Well, after a, couple of, after a day or so of not successfully recording the record and the music that they'd hoped to record that they heard in Washington, D.C., the producer asked me, called me on the phone and said, was I available to come into the studio on a certain day uh, to make this record with a person from Washington, D.C. named Roberta Flagg? Did I know her? I said, not yet. Uh, so he called Ray Lucas, a drummer, a Bucky Pizzarelli, a wonderful guitar player, and ultimately Bill Fisher did the arrangements. And we go to the studio and we all say, hello, how are you? Can we help you? And she says, well, I have this music to play and my, my band never got together, so hopefully you can help this project. I said, well, I can't speak for these guys, but that's what I do. Let's go to work. Okay. Thank you. American Masters PBS will have a special on her in February, is my understanding. So I'm oh. going to be reviewing that for the newspaper I write for. Oh, good for you guys. She's a lovely lady, by the way. And yes. She really plays a great piano, by the way, all you singers out there. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Maestro. You're more than welcome. Okay. Um, Mr. DeRay. Hello. Yes, how are you? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Carter, it's been a long time. I, maybe three, four years now. <laughs> Seems like yesterday. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're uh, doing well. You're, yes, I am. I'm healing nicely. Thank you. Great, great. I Here's my question to you, sir. Okay. Uh, what is it as a professional musician that has been in the business for a lot of years that you still find challenging or difficult? Um, when I finish the date and I'm leaving the studio, 
the guy who hires me for the date says to me, hey, man, I can't believe you just did that. <laughs> Put my hat on. <laughs> like, then, then I go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Jay Gladder, I think that's Joshua Gladder. Am I right? I recognize I your name. Um, is he is a huge Grateful Dead fan. Oh, wow. And the Dead were a huge reason why he got into real jazz. What was the experience like playing Dark Star with Bob Weir and the Wolfpack earlier this year at Radio City? Uh, I was equally stunned by the size of the audience at Radio City. I had, hadn't been in there in a very long time. Uh, and it's a huge, huge, huge place. And to know that all 5,000 of them, whatever, whatever the seating capacity is, knew every song they were playing that night. And most of them stood up for the entire two and a half hour concert. Was it was amazing to me. You know, I'm used to playing with a big size audience, not always the uh, room with a seating capacity of six, you know. Mm -hmm. But to see these people who knew the music that well and knew the Grateful Dead Library was just amazing to me. Having said that, uh, I, th I thought the band was a little cautious than they would normally be, not knowing me. And, and uh, uh, my, my, my attire, that's a good word, what I had on was, 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 was happening, you know. <laughs> I had on shoes, I had on socks, I had a great tie, you know, I had a nice coat, you know. I'm going to work, you know. And, and, and uh, once they realized that I was not masquerading as Ron Carter, that I was really, that was really him, uh, and we got the library worked out, I would like to have had 10 more minutes with this tune to figure out how to do it again. So perhaps we'll get a project going and we've got to get a chance to, to see what else I can show you and how much more can you show me on how this music is supposed to work soon. Uh, thank you very much, Maestro, and also thank you for tolerating my extended feeble attempts at humor <laughs> on Facebook uh, through the last year. May I just, if I can just add that that Dark Star is a song that I have heard more times than I can count, and it's always very different. But I actually didn't attend that show. I attended the next night. But okay. I have since seen a very HD version. And I, I just thought it was extraordinary, particularly the interplay between you and Don was, who has a obviously very different style and, you know, brings to that group sure. a different sound than Phil Lesh does because he's working on Upright. Um, it's interesting to hear your hesitation about it because for those of us who have listened to it and you know there's some folks i'm not one of them who actually collect versions of what they call the song uh that one's a real keeper and uh you should uh not have any false modesty about how <laughs> remarkable it was to hear it in a way that i had not heard it uh before and uh, i only wish i'd been there live so uh uh thank you very much and uh, i wish you as one dealing with a back spasm himself the last two days, <laughs> I wish you a very speedy recovery, Maestro. Thank you. It's good to see you. I like your hand being up. I like that stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Not put it down though. No, 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 no. Okay. I like it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll leave it there in case you want any more of my res uh, unsolicited wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Is it free? Tom Favara has a hand up too. We're going to get to the, all the hands up. So hang okay. On. Thank you. I have two questions. First question. What was the greatest challenge you faced as a musician relative to music? Now, with that, how did you overcome the challenge? What did you learn from it? Um, and how do you apply that today? So that's like the first question. And I have another one. Okay, well, there's enough questions for six weeks to kind of figure out one I can just kind of answer. Just maybe the first part then, what, whatever. That's what comes, okay. Well, yes, sir. I, I, I've always felt Tom, right? Yes, sir. I've always felt that when I got called for a gig, I got called for this gig because I belonged there. Whoever called me, for whatever reasons they decided to do that, had done enough research on me, either their own time or their crew or their person who does all the 
back work of dates and stuff, you know, had done enough listening and deciding that this person, me, uh, would be the nice addition to make this project that they're working on have another level of something, whatever it was. So when I get these calls from people who I don't know, Tom, and, and, and uh, uh, I'm trusting their judgment that they've done the research to think that I'm the person to do that job that they've called me to do. So the, the, the bottom line of your question is that I never felt ill-prepared or that I didn't quite belong there, whatever the project was. Uh, am I looking for the project that kicks my ass? I don't think they write, I don't think they write those things yet. That's cool. <laughs> so one other question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, when you play with a drummer, you're playing with with a, when you're playing with a drummer, yeah. what is the most important quality that you're looking for in that musician? Did he trust where I, did he trust where I play the beat? And then I know the song for him. I trust that he knows those two things about me. Excellent. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Your Alexander Dow. Am I saying it right? You can un oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi, sir. It's, uh, it's an honor to attend another one of these Zoom calls. And uh, I just wanted to say I hope you're having a speedy recovery with the back. I hope you're on the mend. I'm uh, out. Thank you. <laughs> great to hear. So you formed an integral part of many of my favorite albums, one of which is the album Concerto. Uh, 1975, you worked with Jim Hall as well as Paul Desmond, Chet Baker, Steve Gadd, Roland Haller in the Van Gelder Studios. I just wanted to ask if you had any particular uh, special memories or uh, stories of those sessions because it's definitely up there as one of my uh, favorite albums of all time and I love hearing about the stories that you'd never get to know unless you were in the studio with the artists. Okay well I, I, I knew Steve Gadd from upstate New York. I knew his family, his uncle or his cousin who was a, a, a sulky writer you know that I call them sulkies that's what the, the guy's riding a, a a sled basically, and he's pulled along with the horse. Uh, and I had never heard him in the, in the jazz environment. I knew him with the group called Stuff, and I knew him with some James Taylor records along the way. But I never heard him in the real jazz environment, and I had never played with him, I think, before that record. So I was just curious as to what kind of beat he had and what kind of sound he had. How did he tune his drums? Were his cymbals ringing into my notes? Uh, would he trust my judgment if I didn't play a four four quarter notes in a row more than two times? Would he get upset? And would he know I wasn't lost, that I knew the song? Would he trust my note choices? Because I knew he knew music. Did he think I was being a wise guy? Did he think that I was kind of jerking him around? No, I don't know this guy other than a, a brief acquaintance. Uh, so I, all I could do, man, is play what I play. And I think I'm sensitive enough to feelings and vibes to know that if I've gone a little past this person's interest or ability to like, you know, I'm, I'm, I work for a reason, you know, and I'm on the call for a reason. So my first concern was, how can I play with this guy good right away? And how many takes do we have to have before we find out where we belong? Uh, fortunately, everyone's on the, everyone, everyone likes everyone. I mean, I like playing with Roland Hannah. I'm sorry he doesn't get me, didn't get more, more, more ink because he is a penultimate pianist. You know, I always enjoyed Chet Baker and, and the Paul Desmond. Those are guys, man, who made music do what he was doing back in the day. So anytime I have a chance to play with that quality of guy who I seldom see and almost never hear them play live, how can I help them play better? And how can I help them understand this is what I do with a minimum amount of takes and no rehearsal? Having said that, I think Autumn Leaves is on that record, correct? Is that right, Autumn Leaves? I don't believe so. Is that the, is that, one, is that the one with uh, uh, Bob James? No, no, that one has, it has um, You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To. Oh, yeah, has, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the answer yeah. is yes, my personal yeah. favorite. As a matter of fact, Chet Bacon did my, my record shortly after that, uh, Patrao, with mm. uh, Kenny Barron and Jack DeJunette. Uh 
you, you know, when I get those kind of questions, I hope that the asking per person asking these questions is not looking for a page six kind of answer. You know, page six, that's the kind of the general scandal sheet of most newspapers. That's where all the, the social, 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 social dirt comes out and all the complaints. Yeah, I, I don't do that stuff, man. Uh, that's a prelude to my answer that I'm sending backwards, you know. Uh, but when I do these dates, I, I don't look for those kind of positions to be put in that make me have to answer a terrible question. Having said that, I was really pleased and not surprised at how good this drum sounded in the studio. I mean, they were crisp, they were clear, the rim shots weren't too loud, the cymbals was the right pitch for the, my E string, he trusted when I didn't play boom, 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 boom. He wasn't getting that from me. No, I'm not going to do that. And here, Steve Gadd is the third on the downbeat. Bam. And and once he blinked, I knew I had him. So we had a good time. Very happy to hear that. Thank you so much, sir. And I assure you're not looking for a page six answer. Just your fond memories, that's all. It's always great to read the liner notes. And I feel like... You get like an add-on to the liner notes when you get to interact with the artist. Uh, you can, no, you can, thank you, you so much for sharing your experience. And, you get uh, an adult, an adult and an adult. <laughs> an add-on, an add-on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we have one more question from okay. Audrey Hall. Audrey? Audrey. Is the thrill of performing live still the same as it ever was? Yes, indeedy. And not having performed five live in the past four weeks i miss it even more it's the excitement of hoping you find the right notes for these guys and you'll have one chance to get it right yes i love that challenge i'm getting better at that well uh, thank you very much indeed and as everybody it's fantastic to see you back on the mend so uh lots of greetings from the uk and thank you good evening, everyone thank you Um, you know, Maestro is going to be, if any of you are anywhere near or can be near New York City on January 23rd and 24th, he's going to be with his quartet at Blue Note, which will be the, um, uh, you know, the first time, <laughs> first performance back. So um, you can check on our website, too. We have a link to tickets. I, 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 I miss hearing this too. <laughs> well, here we go. I think we can all give you that right now, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> except everybody's muted. Except everyone me, should so unmute. You're not yeah. going to hear it. Everyone should I, unmute. I, 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 I like to. I like to look at the hands go like this. <laughs> right. 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 Here. <laughs> yeah. Jazz style. One, one more question. Somebody said. Is that you, Mr. Gladder? One more question? No, not me. Nobody has one more question? Well, I have about 400, but I want well, to hear Yeah. I'm firing now. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. It's my show. It's by our house. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, I was just wondering if in your recovery time, have you been dreaming on or considering uh, – new new ways or alternative ways or in anything you would like to change about your approach to in, your instrument or music in general what what are you dreaming of for that first hit and uh and your your future once you come back uh i have i've, I've always had some ideas on how i think my music the music can work and this being off days have given me a chance to not be concerned with that i'm concerned with my health I'm concerned with my health. I'm concerned with the people who I love. I don't see. I don't see Irene or James or Peyton nearly enough to to tell them how much I miss them because I am missing them more. Uh, what I'm enjoying doing is, is working on my library because these are thoughts I have on how to play the bass, how to play changes, how to play rhythms, stuff that takes quite a bit of physical downtime uh, to put the book in an order that's can be taught, used by people who want to learn it with me not standing next to them over their shoulder telling them what to do. Uh, have, uh -huh. Having said that, and I, I've also enjoyed uh, buying some nice ties. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I haven't worn them anywhere yet, but I'll come January 23 or 24, you get there, you see some nice ties that I've been saving for those two engagements, those two nights. So thank you for asking, and I hope to see you if you're around. Yes, I look forward to our next, uh, our next time together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, we will do this again before too long, and hope to see you all then. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Hi. Hi. Happy holidays. Thank you very much. Happy Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. To Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank and you. Thank you to all for arranging this. Thank you, Miss uh, to Penny and Simone. A wonderful oh, session. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Glasser. Nice to see you. You as well. You well. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you.